Mm-hmm. News watch. News watch. So I'm getting, this I'm getting this feedback, feedback somewhere back there. So I'm going to mute everybody up if we figure that one out here. There are some new faces. I'm checking this one out here. Just got a little bit of a loop. Now it's gone. Okay. Which means the winner is, was it Storm Jones? Oh, uh, no. Maybe not. Maybe it was Brittany. Maybe that was here. I've got it. Un, I've got it muted in this hand. For what it's worth. And by the way, the man who needs no introduction in my screen, it's upper right hand corner is Dr. Larry Bookman, MD. Can I take uh, you guys back to about two years ago where we start off with the story about what everybody's talking about? This is Storm Jones. By the way, do you know the music that um, that you were listening to in the intro? Is that familiar to you? Don't tell me that's Ryan Welton. That's Ryan Welton. <laughs> You thought you were on a weekend at KGOU, didn't you? That's, That's it. Exactly what it's like. Smooth. Jazz. I almost got my KGOU coffee cup tonight. But... Did you really? Yeah. It's really great to have you both, Storm and Brittany. Yeah, Our guest uh, has left us tonight. So anyway, she's got some business to do, but good to have you guys. So this is a couple of years ago. Dr. Bookman may remember this. So that's almost two years ago at Tower Theater when we started 60 straight days of COVID coverage, because you know what? It's going to be over in 60 days. <laughs> the two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah, that's right. It's going and to then, disappear. And then, <laughs> then we had to close the studio at News 9. So there is how we were doing your vote counts and hot seat, okay, virtually, how we were rigging that thing. So that was new. I mean, I'm sure the studio is never going to be closed again. Okay. So there's Larry Bookman. This was at Tower, and we had, and by the way, it took like 50 engineers to get this thing going, Joy Mitchell and Stephen Tyler. So that's where, that was a couch that was down at Tower. And then that's what Larry Bookman was looking at. He was president of Oklahoma State Medical Association at the time. So that was his monitor. Well, we were using a thing called Restream. Is that what that says, Dr. Bookman? Mm-hmm. Yep. Those were some heady days, and that was two, that's almost two years ago, Dr. Bookman. Can you, you believe this? The- you should have had the picture with the governor. That was night number two, by the way. That That's was the right. second show. And I asked Storm, guess how many viewers we had that night? 40,000. Wow. I mean, that was what was happening. People were so frightened. In the early days, Dr. Bookman was tech. People would call up and go, all right, here's my blood pressure and my oat. Remember that, Dr. Bookman? When people would ask him, what should I do? Here's And they would give their vitals on the air when we were streaming oh, wow. this News 9 News on 6. I asked and, for their bank accounts, but they never <laughs> gave me that. <laughs> oh, man. So you guys are kind of storming. Brittany, y'all are covering COVID stories again. Here we are. Dr. Bookman, two years since WHO was, like, kicking it in high gear. Uh, so let me ask the first question. Brittany and Storm, jump in. What what have we learned after two years? Um, my answer is we need to stay away from political politicalization of any disease, but especially a pandemic. Um, It's caused all kinds of problems. One thing I remember reporting on and like not realizing how few people did this was like properly washing your hands. And it sounds kind of funny, but like the thought of it is most people kind of would just and go but like that's not a sufficient way to clean your hands and when we were you know the transferring of it it was i just remember so many people minds were blown of oh i was supposed to do happy birthday twice in my head to wash my hands i thought just soap and water was good to go and you're like oh my gosh no wash your hands that uh i was thinking back the first case in oklahoma i missed my brother's wedding rehearsal because the first case of covid positive case came back on a friday night out of Tulsa. Remember the guy went over to Italy. That was our first case in the state. Had to miss his wedding reception because we were trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, that's what I blamed it on anyway. But I just remember how freaked out we were about that first case. And now it just seems like it's everyone's going to get it at some point. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know if, but that's just the feeling right now is it's not all that uncommon. I mean, I couldn't count on my hands and toes how many people I know right now who have gotten it within the past week. Yeah, and, and one of the problems that, that we've seen also is how uh, this country was not ready for this pandemic. We had warning 
Uh, but we did nothing with the warning and we weren't ready. We still don't have adequate testing, um, which is all over the world. It's free. It's easy to get, except in this country. Yeah, and now, you know, we're told some of the big retailers, box stores are increasing the price. Instead of decreasing it to make it more available, we're going to increase it and make fewer people be able to actually get uh, tested. Um, it's so, really a shame. As a medical professional, and we're now two years into this <clears throat> pandemic, is it at all frustrating that we don't have testing under control when testing has been a consistent need throughout this whole pandemic? I could spend this whole program on the frustration. Oh, what do we, what do we got back there? <laughs> um, I could spend it on the frustration of the medical professionals uh, from techs to nurses, to physicians who have had to treat those of us who for the last year have been on weekly talking, asking, begging people to get vaccinated, to get boosted, to get tested, to wear masks, simple, simple things. And yet it falls on deaf ears for about a third of our population. And it's, it's very frustrating. It's frustrating as a physician. It's frustrating as a human being who's worried about our children, who's worried about our elderly. I mean, the whole idea was to protect each other, not just worry about me. But this day and age, everything seems to be about me. And um, I, yeah, there's a lot of frustration. I said earlier, Dr. Bookman, that it seems like everyone's going to get this at some point. Is that kind of how, is that the, where we're heading right now? Is ever, you know, the a large swath of the population is going to get Omicron and then it's going to run out of fuel or, or what, what's that like? It's not going to run out of fuel. Um, with a third of the population not vaccinated, it has lots of hosts available out there. Um, whether everybody will get it, a large percentage are going to get it. And as people get it, especially the unvaccinated, um, as they get it, as they have it longer, then more mutations will occur and we'll move from Omicron to the next Greek letter to the next Greek letter. And as we've seen from Omicron, it doubled every two to three days in the number of cases. Um, while deaths have decreased, so it is not as deadly hospitalizations have not really decreased and the number of cases has skyrocketed uh, more than 20,000 cases locally in the last week. That's more than double what we were seeing. So um, no, I, I do think that everybody who's unvaccinated will eventually get this. Um, we will have many more deaths. We've had over 800,000 deaths in this country. Um, Un, unprecedented. Uh, the pandemic of 1918 only had about 600, 650,000 deaths. So we far surpassed that and we're still going up. Um, so we've got a long ways to go. We're, we're not going to see the end of this. I don't think even in 2022 will we see the end of it. And until we get people to uh, get vaccinated, to get boosted, I do think there's going to be selective boosters out. Um, we're going to have oral, uh, antivirals out by spring, uh, March and April. I think those are all going to be important factors in trying to reduce the numbers. What we really want to get is not to get rid of the virus. What we want to do is get it like the flu where you get a yearly booster and, you know, you get some people who get sick, but people don't die and we don't overwhelm our hospitals. And so with us, you know, having access to the vaccine and already you said most people needing boosters and still half the population here in Oklahoma is not fully vaccinated. I believe it's like 70 plus percent has one shot, but that two, which fully vax is almost now three shots, um, right. but only half have two shots. What can you we do as news media? What can you medical professionals say to these people who just aren't getting the vaccine? and haven't gotten it, what can we do to kind of make them do it? it or is it just kind of a, a moot effort at this point? Um, well, now you're asking opinion versus science. So I'll give you my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that is, 
uh, I've said for a long time, quit talking about one shot. One shot gives people about a 30% immunity to Delta and less than that, about 10% immunity to Omicron. So it's almost worthless to get one shot. Only report those who are fully vaccinated, those who have had two shots of the messenger RNA uh, with a booster, that to me is fully vaccinated now. If you don't have the booster, you're not fully vaccinated. Um, Johnson & Johnson, unfortunately, has not proven to be all that effective. So that if you got the J&J, &J, you need a second shot, and then you need the booster as well. Um, because one shot of J&J &J just really hasn't proven to be very effective with Omicron. And as far as what can we do, all you can do is keep trying to educate. You, I don't believe in mandates. I don't think, you know, originally they worked. They increased it by about 30 percent. Um, I do think that individual employers have that right. As an employer myself, I have the right to set the rules for my employees. I don't think that's the federal government's responsibility. Uh, but I do think we need to educate people. We need to keep encouraging people. We need to have programs that encourage, that are positive programs. Um, I do know that insurance companies right now are looking at um, actually charging unvaccinated people a higher premium than those who are vaccinated. I think that's going to make a difference. I think just like smokers get charged uh, an, an extra premium, um, unvaccinated should as well, because we're paying for their hospitalizations. I was talking earlier about knowing a lot of people who have COVID right now. A lot of them are triple vaccinated. And I know the symptoms may be as severe and they're definitely not in the hospital. But do you think that hurts the cause maybe the, to get people vaccinated when they say, look at all these people have three shots and they're still home from work on the couch? I do think it hurts, and that's where education helps. We have got to get away from the fact that the vaccines are going to prevent the disease, that they're going to do away with the virus, and it's going to disappear. People need to understand this virus is here. It's going to be here in some form. Some mutant is going to be around for a very long time. The vaccines, the boosters, the hopefully yearly booster that we may need are all to prevent you from getting seriously ill, being hospitalized and dying. We've lost over 820,000 people in this country. We didn't need to lose that many. So any of us who have lost friends due to COVID understand there was no reason for this now. And understand, we only had, a year ago, the vaccines came out. We only had 250,000 deaths at that time. We're now at over 820,000 deaths despite vaccines. So it's the unvaccinated who are in the hospital, in the ICU, who are dying from this. And that's why you get vaccinated. Can I put you on the spot, Dr. Bookman? Yeah, well, sure. You know, You've do done everything. it before. <laughs> So when you look at the 40% that are out there that for one reason or another still haven't done what what science medical professionals say is the responsible thing to do. I mean, as my daughter, the RN, she doesn't suffer this sort of stuff very well. So, and she's invited people to do MMA if they want to tell her no on vaccines. <laughs> but what's been the, what is the single biggest problem? Has it been bureaucrats that couldn't, Communicate straight. I know Dr. Armitage is like holding up his hand if he's watching and going, CDC. Um, or is it politicians? I mean, one famous politician two weeks ago came out and said, I've been boosted. Vaccines are great. And just got the heck beat out of them, right, from a certain faction of the Republican Party. So what is the biggest misinformation problem out there? A couple, three years ago, when we were talking about measles coming back, it was about 10% of the population that would were opposed to vaccines. And now we're looking at an enormous amount of people that still won't get the vaccines. Who do you put the blame on? 
I'd say there's a 1A and a 1B. 1A is it got in the political arena from the very get-go. And that shifted a lot of people away from science and away from the doctors and the scientists and what they were recommending into, you know, certain political heads say this, and it must be true because they say it. And it wasn't true. It was all a lie. Um, and so I think that started the trend to um, disbelieve what the scientists and the physicians were saying. But I do think that 1B is the CDC. I think the communication from our government and the CDC, mostly the CDC, um, and Dr. Fauci has been horrendous. And it has confused people. It has led to disbelief. It has led to um, people going, well, they changed their mind. How do I know what to do? And therefore, I'm not going to do anything. I think a perfect example happened this last week when the CDC came out with, if you're not symptomatic and you've been vaccinated, you only have to isolate for five days. Now, two days later, they're coming out with, oh, you isolate for five days, but but you really probably ought to test. Not you should test, you ought to test. If you look at United Kingdom, it's seven days and you have to have two negative tests. If you look at Germany, it's 10 days. If you look at most of the world, the WHO, it's 10 days or 14 days. So what are people supposed to believe and follow when everybody's got a different set of rules and our CDC changes the rules weekly? You know what so we I, call that, by the way? Do you remember what? The... <laughs> Falsification. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and I, I was with Dr. Armitage today. So sure. he, hopefully he's listening and he'll be proud. <laughs> yeah, he loves that slide. He absolutely loves that slide. Well, listen, thanks for um, yeah, We want people to know that Monday nights are coming back. So we, it's going to look a little different, I think. Dr. Bookman and I are still discussing how that's going to be. But what will we, we can't go away in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> you know? Well, we, yeah, we, we've got some discussion to do, but uh, we, we will stay around. Um, maybe let people think about it for a few weeks in between. So, uh, uh, but we'll be here to answer questions. And, and I think that's really what we want is for people to be able to ask questions and let us answer them accurately with science and true information and not the, the disinformation and misinformation that's been so rampant during this last two years. I've been watching the, uh, health outcomes in Oklahoma over the last two or three years before COVID. And in, when it comes to the health draft, we get the number one pick every year. You know what I'm talking about here. I mean, we're in the cellar. We're going to get, I don't know who number one pick is going to be this year, but we'll get it because our outcomes are so bad. And, and, and frankly, we had switched away from just COVID. This was a Ryan Wilton deal. We we're like March of this year or last year. We we're going, hey, it's starting to go down. And then <laughs> Delta airlines started flying. Just about the time we changed the name and we were going to cover mental health and a lot of these health outcomes we needed to discuss, boom, we were right back in with Delta and got ready to do it again. And boom, right back in it with our homie Omi. So, you know, this is, it just never seems to stop. Dr. And Ray, I think, you? well, I think people need to realize we're going to see peaks and valleys. We've seen them for the last two years. We're going to continue to see that. What we've got to do is see the valley of deaths and hospitalizations. Um, quit worrying about how many people have tested positive. Worry about who's in the hospital, who's dying, and get those numbers down, and we'll all be much better off. All right. Have a great evening. It's good to see you, Dr. Bookman. It's good to be here. Good to see both of you all. Uh, thank you for all you do. So keep trying. All right. All right. We'll see you soon. Hi, doctor. Goodbye. All right. So Dr. Larry Buckman is, uh, he's just the greatest. And when we did 60 straight, he was there every single day in addition to wow. his practice. Wow.
So we were, by the way, that was, I have to give a shout out to, on, uh, to Storm Jones on this. So my 19 year old at the time was producing the show because we were locked out of studios everywhere. Right. And whenever, uh, he was just kind of, you know, he was okay about broadcasting and then he met Storm Jones. <laughs> Storm Jones went to, you know, there went you out, go. I, I went to EOC to the career tech over there, talked to Ben Alavity's class yep. and about 10 state championships later. Um, by the way, he's, uh, it took some time out because of COVID and, you know, I'm a no you alum and obviously storm is so Joey Mitchell is, uh, resuming his college career. I was thrilled to death. He said, I got two things to tell you, dad. This is three months ago, going back to college. I said, what's the, butt? <laughs> yeah, going to Stillwater. And so he's going to be a, a cowboy. I didn't know this update. Yeah. 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 So. Ben Laverty is no, having a great time with this. He'll overcome it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great universe. He moves in tomorrow. It's going to be kind of oh, a, wow. it's going to be wow. a tough day for mom and dad tomorrow. So anyway, thanks for everything as you did for that class storm and uh, helping all those. Aspire. There's some really great kids that have been in that tech program. Ben Halavity, who's a movie maker. Okay. Yeah. And the, the EOC program is turning out some great journalists. There's some working at news nine. So really great too. All right. Switching gears. You know, probably the first episode we did on Newswatch Oklahoma um, with Augusta was we talked about a video that, that somebody had sent me about Commissioner Brian Mon. This was about eight weeks ago about some changes inside the jail. And you both have done stories on this. I think the majority of people had seen some really great TV uh, down there between the jail trust, the commissioners, and a lot of folks with bullhorns and, and great disagreements. And then in this really quiet voice that one day commissioner Mon said, we've been making a lot of changes to the jail. And so I decided I'd heard all of this and I heard people go and after our first broadcast and they said, it's not really true. So I went down and asked to see, and, uh, since they had done all the changes and storm, you'd been there some time before. And they said, well, the really the, the first person that's seen the rehab effort was Brittany. Mm -hmm. And so I got to go through that and then story ran. So this was a storm Jones story that ran yesterday that caught my eye. And if you don't mind, I'm going to run this package, which ran, this was your package yesterday storm. Yeah, I think so. All right, here it is. It was a lot cleaner than I had ever seen it. And I was, a, I was pleasantly surprised. One year ago, News 9 took you behind bars at the troubled facility. We've had seven holes to the outside since I've been here. The jail was plagued by bed bugs, mold, staffing issues, escapes, and overcrowding. Everything I'm reporting is good. But today, a different story, according to County Commissioner Kerry Blumert. But it's still our jail. It's still not an easy place to be, but I have seen market improvements. Each county commissioner is required by law to visit the facility and report back their findings once a year. Bloomert says she spent nearly two hours in the facility last month and was pleased with improvements in the cleanliness and care being given to detainees. The mold was gone. I didn't smell the mold. This time was significantly better. Um, you could tell that they had put a lot of effort into making the place a cleaner space. Despite the much improved report, Bloomert says the jail still struggles with staffing issues and she still supports building a new facility. It's just not an adequate facility for the human needs that we have in that building. People need fresh air. They need to be able to move around. Um, we need space for our community partners. Last month, commissioners unanimously agreed to begin the process of figuring out just how to build a new facility, a process Bloomert says has a long road ahead. Storm Jones, Oklahoma Zone, News 9. All right, so that was Storm's story from yesterday. And Brittany, you've done this. I hear a couple, three stories here. Number one, and I think this is from the get-go when the first episode we did, which was there's the physical plant, physical plant, and then there's the programming, the way people are treated. Mm -hmm. So, Carrie Bloomert had said both have improved. Just throw it out for both of you. Can we also factor this in, and then I'll be quiet. There's also the possibility of a vote on a jail as early as March, could be late November, but there, 
that has a lot to do with the DA. There's a lot to unpack here in this story, correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and how, how they pay for the new jail is a big question, right? There's like there's four funding streams to watch. And obviously the American Rescue Plan uh, funds exactly what they can pay for. Someone was telling me like maybe an elevator would qualify, but a stairwell wouldn't. HVAC may mm -hmm. qualify. Sewage may qualify. So you a have roof that. Won't, and like this jail needs a new roof. So if they have that funding, they can't use that funding to fix that either. I'm talking about building a new facility, though. Oh, yeah. A new one. So there's going to be piecemealed with the American mm -hmm. Rescue Plan funds. The state also has American Rescue Plans funds that folks in the county can apply for. Um, then there's a bond issue expiring that generates about $300 million. Um, that one was started back in 2004 out of Tinker. Remember that bond issue? And it's been used for different things since then. And then finally, one that I hadn't heard of, but talking to folks around the county that they're eyeing as a possibility is MAPS4 money that was earmarked for mental health. Um, I was calling around some people preparing for this evening, and that was the first time I'd ever heard about someone mentioning the possibility of using that money. There's a lot of boxes to check on the funding side of things. The vote last month was to say, hey, we want to build a new jail. That may have been the easy part. And then figuring out how you pay for it comes after that, I guess. Yeah, and even the jail staff will, like um, the jail PIO, Mark, will be the, one of the first to say they, they want a new facility as well. They want a new building. That building there was not designed by the, the people who designed that building, I believe, were not. They've never designed a jail before. Like there are parts of that building that shouldn't be in a jail. Like the, the push up ceilings where you have like little tiles you can push up. The jail has that. A jail should not have that. And it's just like little things like that where you can tell that, that that building is not meant for what it's being used for. Well, I can I can I can attest to that. I mean, because I'd covered that a uh, jail's it's kind of old, but nonetheless, the architectural firms had some good ones, by the way, but they never had uh, done a correctional facility. It's kind of a political marriage if you look back on it or when you look back on it. And there were some excellent architects, by the way. It was just at, kind of outside their lane. All right. So what's the driver? I mean, it, from what I understand, there's going to be some public officials that can say yay or nay on some of the funds. And that impacts how what you put on a bond issue, right? Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's one of the issues that's plagued uh, getting a new jail is it's extremely unpopular. Public opinion polling shows between 70 and 80 percent of folks say, do not raise my taxes to build a jail. So if they can pitch this bond that's expiring and say, hey, uh, we're not raising your taxes. We just want you to approve this. Your taxes will say the same. I always think that's an interesting argument, but it works a lot of the times, it seems. But they did hire um, a law firm to go through and kind of tell them yay or nay on what they can use American Rescue Plan funds for in the new facility. And so it's not going to be like a big letter from the Department of Treasury that says, yes, build your jail. It's going to be a lot of different line item things. But they do have a law firm, I had it written down somewhere, that's kind of helping the county sort through all that. So it'll, I mean, it'll be a long process on that. Now my dog, Brittany. They hurt each other. <laughs> Our dogs are friends. That's it. They are friends. They hang out. But. So I, did, I thought it was Coach Mike McCarthy in the background whining about something. <laughs> By the way, we're Packer fans out here. Anyway, so oh no, um, oh god, oh that's oh that's, that's a oh. that sounds like a Minnesota Ooh. fan. Whew. I was like, so that's that, worse than OU OSU rivalry. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, that was a. I don't want to talk about Sunday night. That was kind of bad. All right, now uh, back to where we were headed. So there is what's changed in the last 10 years is there are community leaders who've gotten involved in justice reform. It doesn't always mean everybody's lockstep, but we, we saw a death here recently, uh, a person who it was scheduled to be evaluated in Venita. My understanding was it still hadn't happened. So from a programming standpoint, you've got a uh, cash bail. That's going to be an issue at the legislature. You've got, mental health treatment, mental health folks telling me, because you can't do treatment inside that building. Um, I mean, how many issues could we likely see legislatively that are going to tie not into, not into just statewide, but also into that particular program? That, that is a large facility or a large uh, detention facility in Oklahoma. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's tons. And it, when you talk about criminal justice reform, 
I mean, obviously we're getting close to the election. And so you're liable to see in any number of things. But that's another interesting thing, just talking to folks again, how criminal justice reform has become less political, maybe, you know, or more, more bipartisan, maybe. It's, it's probably still political. But there are um, folks on either side getting involved in this and willing to uh, willing to step up and, and support things that bring down the population of the jail. That's another thing they have to look at when you look at the wear and tear on this facility is, you know, how many federal prisoners we were housing there for a while. The sheriff's department generating money off that to run the facility. That place was stuffed for a long time and it's come down. And I think had COVID not happened, the numbers inside would continue to come down, but you have things backing up. When I went in a year ago, I talked to a guy, uh, ended up being convicted of a violent, violent murder, but he was in there waiting for three and a half years for a trial. That's not how it's supposed to work. Folks are supposed to, you know, whether they're guilty or, or, or not of their crime, you got to get them to court. And then if they're guilty, get them to the penitentiary. Could I play a clip from a couple of weeks ago? I, I, it's interesting to me, and you know the storm being an OU guy, that Keith Gaddy, who is on the faculty at the Gaylord College, also is on the faculty at the now at the architectural school. Are you aware of the story, Storm? Is this where they had the students design a potential? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is Keith Getty, who is one of the most prolific po- political scientists in this country and a Georgia bulldog, by the way, you know, where his heart is right now. <laughs> he does, by the way, think that Lou Saban, uh, not Lou Saban, but uh, Nick Saban has a deal with Satan. That's another discussion. We did get so, a press release that the bulldogs have some of the biggest bandwagon fans. Just throwing it out there. It was one, yeah. It was somewhere today or yesterday. I was reading. It was like, what college sports have the biggest bandwagon fan base? Brittany, our mascot is a bandwagon at OU. I don't know if you. <laughs> <laughs> so I yes. can technically be a bandwagon fan for real yes. in full yes. time. So we go Dr. completely Gaddy. off the we go completely off the wagon routes on that one right there. But Gaddy's great though. I had him at OU. Phenomenal guy. But I did see your discussion. Here's a so this was about this goes directly to what we're talking about, which is. The way a building is built. So at hot seat a few days ago, and this is what he's, and he's at now at the architectural school, Brittany just referred to the, what the students were doing. So here's a real cool question. It's about a 40 second clip. But does architecture influence how people are treated in these facilities? Absolutely. Because, you know, the way you shape the space is going to dictate how people are, how people are treated. The more light you let into a space, uh, the better materials you use that cut down on tinniness and loud noises the more uh, calm that population is going to be. We've got good science on that. How you set up the spaces to flow impacts how people behave. Here's a simple one that my students ran down on. You don't want to make a door of one cell face a door in another cell because it creates tension between the people that are uh, housed in those two cells. It creates animosity. So how you shape the space, how people are angled towards each other, how you move them around has a big impact on the experience. How you create a space for visitors to come in and visit with a family member who's being detained in that jail has a big influence on that experience. The idea is if somebody has been, let's remember what jails do. They exist for short-term incarceration and somebody has processed to go through the, through um, their due process, right? Determination of guilt. Some people are detained because they can't make bail for the long term. Others are processed in, processed out. Then you've got people that are in transition who've already been sentenced. And we have to think about how the experiences of each of these types of people and how to cut down on conflict, but also try and build a little bit better person coming out. Space dictates how you do that. He, he wrapped it up pretty good there. Jails are not prisons. They're not. And the Oklahoma the, the detention center, I, I believe back about a year ago when you were there, Storm, when I went in in September, back then it was about four times as many people that were supposed to be in that jail. That, that were, and they were crammed in there. The doors in like another reason, like in case of an emergency, say something wild happened at the jail, they need to get the prisoners out into the safety. Before they would have to individually go and unlock every single door on each pod. That's just not efficient. That just, it just wasn't built to house as many people as it did. And that kind of, uh, you mentioned cash bail being a thing. A lot of people are in there just because they can't afford the bail to get out. So there's those bodies in there as well. So it's it, it just wasn't built 
for what it's being used for and like the ventilation system. So one major issue was that standing water was the mold, was that the shower pressure, all of that stuff was because the ventilation system was keeping all of that moisture in and just rotting that building pretty much. And there was the water pressure above a certain floor wasn't get, wasn't getting there because the, the, it wasn't the, the system wasn't strong enough to push it up. It just had so many issues and I don't know, they, I'm excited. They're pushing towards a newer jail, but I, I agree with storm. It's going to be a lot of push and pull, a lot of pulling from funds from here and here to kind of almost figure out how to sew the funding to get this thing together. That's one, one thing goes, uh, you know, things that can be fixed in this facility and things that will have to come from a new facility. All I talked to all three County commissioners this week about the jail, just to pick their brain on it. All of them said, one thing they're greatly uh, uh, have seen great improvement on is letting folks out of their cells for recreation time. That was something that no matter who you talked to before or who um, interacting with the process, whether it be uh, a detainee or, or, or a jailer, uh, these folks were locked up for maybe all but one hour a day. And in certain situations, obviously, uh, emergencies, people have to be locked up on certain floors. There's violent people. There's people who, for whatever reason, can't interact with one another. But that's one resounding positive I've heard from everyone I've talked to on this is folks are allowed outside of their cell more frequently. And going back to what Dr. Gaddy was saying is whenever you, you know, allow people to have this more human experience, walking around, interacting with one another, there's less violent interactions, there's less assaults on guards. And whenever Greg Williams took over the facility, that's one thing that he told me, like, you know, he wants to care for these people. You know, they are people and he wants to know he he wants them to know he might not be able to solve all the problems, but he wants them to know he's working on solving the problems. The quality of the food, stuff like that just helps human nature to, to take the edge off a little bit. Obviously, there's massive problems. I mean, obviously, none of us would choose to spend a night in that facility. Um, it's, it is a jail and there's always going to be a, a, a bit of that. But um, an interesting thing an interesting thing on the timeline we we're talking about is there is a long road. Of, there's a lot to figure out, right? But so, uh, someone was telling me that they see the county purchasing or eyeing land before the summer, having a plot of land designated and voted on uh, before the summer, and then the construction phase being between two and five years. So there's a lot of boxes to check, but that's pretty quick. I mean, that, that that's a pretty quick um, progression, I guess. And I think that goes to show just how badly it's needed. And I think officials also agree, like, hey, we kind of need this. We have to kind of get all this stuff going. I was, I know that when I went, my, this is the tour, which had, had happened right, not too long after yours, Brittany, when I was looking at some of these before and after pictures, yes. was right first floor, here's another, that was in the, the that, basement. That's the, the, and that basement had consistently, I think they said like three to five inches of water daily. They would spend, maintenance staff would spend hours cleaning up the water just wow. to clean it up the next day. And that took time and resources away from other maintenance issues as well. But yeah, they're just. Just awful. Not All right. Cool. So here's, here's the afters. So I think that is the uh, pipe that nobody would ever want to talk about. So that see, they replaced, you can tell the new stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, the garage you talked about, well, there it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, and that's just basically that stain from water running. That's a door there at the yep. top center. That's all the new, they actually have hot water now. Yeah. The let's say that's doors. hot water. They can, they have access to hot water now, which was also a big issue and an, an issue that understandably made life even worse for the people there not having hot water. Could you imagine being in jail and then yeah. not even having access to hot water? So Here's a, that pop we were looking at just a moment ago. That was, I think that has to do with the sewage system. I will, here it is today. Okay. Those all are new. the grinders. Actually. Yeah, grinders. Yes. And we don't they, want to tell you what they're grinding. Oof, all kinds yeah. of stuff. Not, actually, not yeah. as many things anymore, thanks to the new flushing system. Yeah. And uh, so there's one you can see where the weld was, right? That's the yep. new the new locks. The new locks. And those locks also um, are automatic. You can see the lights, so they can open them. And the locks before were inside the door. So, like, you know how there is a the little hole in the the, the catch. So before inmates would break the locks because they could were able to kind of stuff stuff in there if they wanted to. 
And this prevents that as well, because that was also costly to fix. It would ha cause them to have to move inmates if the door was broken to a cell. So that's, it was a, a big deal for them, actually, those locks. And here's the sports book. I'm just, no, it's just kidding. <laughs> that is the, that's the uh, program. I didn't put a border on that one, but that's where they can see all the systems. Yep. Upper left, I think, is the air. Yep. Uh, cells in the middle, top middle. So that's a control. That top control middle is the flushing system. Okay. Yeah, it prevents them. They can um, shut off the, the, where the toilets won't flush anymore because before, if it, people, like flooding of the floors was an intentional flooding of the floors was an issue and they could um, kind of flush and flush and flush and clog, now they can shut down the flushing ability for um, about five-ish minutes completely to that cell. And if they try flushing after it's shut down, they can see it and keep track. And so a lot of contraband searches, if they were doing contraband searches, they'd shut the flushes off and then see where the flushing was happening. So to, kind of, to kind of close the door on this, what's, what's the January story should we be watching for for this particular story? I think the, the money stuff is going yeah. to start happening really soon, uh, getting a bond scheduled. Um, like I said, the MAPS 4 was the first time I'd, have, I'd heard of that proposal. That's one thing I was thinking, of, Scott, when we're looking at all these pictures, is a lot of that, uh, those upgrades were through CARES Act funds. And all of them were. Using kind of, you know, they'd say, well, COVID can travel through fecal matter, so we need to fix the sewage system. And you're like, well, that's a little creative. Um, but they're using it, and, and mm -hmm. we're all celebrating the success now. So and I that's think kind of part of the CARES Act money was them – figuring out ways to use it that you may have not been, you know, a COVID unit and they were able to do that, but you can't do that with everything. Like you said. It's just interesting though, because at the time you're scratching your head, but, uh, but like I said, the, the facility's reaping the rewards now. Um, did it have to do with COVID mitigation? I don't know. Uh, is the jail a better place for using that money in that way? Yeah. Uh, they did take some heat over that. Remember? Oh, I mean, yeah. There was a real heat over yeah. taking that money. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, you know, the whole story it takes a while to develop. Uh, the next one is a kind of a failure on my part because I was not able to get the, the Brittany packets from today up, but we've got to have a mention here because uh, anytime that you say Bonnie and Clyde, you know, any people my age, I, you know, I knew Bonnie and Clyde, but uh, anyway, so for in folklore in this part of the country, right. People know that story and we've seen all the movies and still, you know, part of our, uh, I think didn't I think Costner had a movie a couple of years ago? How I mean, the story yeah. keeps coming around. Yeah, right? who killed Bonnie and Clyde, and and it was you know why was Gene Hackman in their gang? So, and what the point was is that there was a story today, and I and I'm walking through the room, and you know there's all mayhem and all kinds and bad weather's coming all this. Then I saw Brittany doing this story on Bonnie Parker, and I stopped. Okay, and most so if you haven't seen it, Parker is. Yeah, but Bonnie you know, Parker mm -hmm. was not a, a basketball player. She was a, a bank robber. Yes, and um, and a poetress, right? She wrote a lot of wrote a lot of poetry. So, uh, but nonetheless, so this is, has to do with Oklahoma history. Mm -hmm. And take it away, Brittany, because and go to news9.com, news6.com. You can see her story. This is fascinating to me. Yeah, and honestly, me at myself as not a native Oklahoman, being able to kind of connect to something like this, I jumped at the chance to because Bonnie and Clyde, like you said, legendary. Everyone kind of knows who they are. And being in the region where they were and hearing that a potential artifact from that time is at the museum down the street from the station, it was mind blowing. So, yeah, there is a, a purse that may or may not have been on Bonnie when Bonnie and Clyde were kind of gun down and that like hail of gunfire. We've all seen the picture of the car that's got just hundreds of bullet holes in it. And the purse has one as well. So it's very interesting. And Bonnie Parker is carved in the bag. How are they figuring that out? How are they trying to trace that back? So the, um, the, the UCO is doing a forensic testing. Excuse me one second. I'm sorry, my dog, I've not paid attention to her There's in dog, a yeah. while and she's getting mad. Um, but so the UCO Forensic um, Institute is running tests. So they've already done DNA swabs on it. And they have, obviously, the bag is almost 100 years old at this point. So dozens of people have touched it and handled it. But there's also a living relative to Bonnie Parker living in Texas. She's about 87 years old. So they're going to um, compare any 
profiles they get from that to her. Also, they're doing fingerprinting. And once again, like I said, handled by hundreds of people. And with the bag being so old, they can't use typical powders or anything to lift prints. So they're going to use different light sources, including UV light, to look up any fingerprints. Um, they're also matching fabrics, uh, making sure that fabric was a fabric that was used um, in the region at the time. They can do that. And also the bullet hole is something they can look at too, is, is it matching the caliber used? Because um, obviously the, the guns um, that gunned down Bonnie and Clyde are well known. So we know what kind of caliber they were and do they match on that. So it's super interesting that um, I know I, I was geeked out <laughs> talking to everybody. I was so excited listening about it today. It's a cool story. You know, hopefully it'll be if the exhibit will be up in November. Um, and it's also actually it's called Outlaw Man. So I thought it was pretty funny that the kind of crux of the um, exhibit is a, a female outlaw. Um, at least the excitement part right now is a female outlaws uh, item. But yeah, it was super cool. And he said the name Bonnie Parker is carved in it, but they don't think Bonnie actually did that. Um, most most women don't carve their names in their purses, even in the 1920s and 30s. So they think the person who acquired it after carved her name in it, just kind of marking this is Bonnie Parker's. But yeah, right now they're just trying to kind of back that claim up. Um, and if not, it's still a super interesting kind of artifact from that time. And everyone's still kind of excited to just be on the journey of finding out if it is Bonnie Parker's purse. I, I would go see it. Which, by the way, I think we referenced early on where you're from. So, you know, that means, you know, there's the Chicago area. You could go pilgrimages to the biograph and see where the lady in red, you know, helped kill Dillinger. I've been there, by the way. It's uh, the, the alleyway, as you know, Brittany, is no longer an alleyway. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that old stuff, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre place is not an actual location anymore either. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of history there too, but the wild west the old west is it's just got some kind of like nostalgia you know and just to i i, I just want i want to touch the bag i want to touch it even if it wasn't bonnie's it was a wild west purse it, it's so cool i'm i'm fascinated by it well you have to be careful by the way you have to be careful in chicago okay and i'm gonna tell you what you never do in chicago or uh -oh. Brittany is from, go to okay? a Cubs game. which is <laughs> never go to soldier field in the fall in packer in, in a packer jacket yeah uh, i've done that twice and you will right. not, they do not like you in Soldier Field. No, I, I, I yeah. will say that is a, a bold move. A okay. bold move. I don't have so, uh, anything about that. It's the, uh, <laughs> it's, it's OU Texas. Okay. It really is just nasty here. Mm -hmm. okay. By the way, so Lou Malnati or. Um, Geos. Geos. Yes. My boyfriend actually is a Lou's fan. So that's the second biggest point of contention. Or the first is he's a Cubs fan and I'm a White Sox fan. Right anyway, I don't know. Well, she's already starting to fight among Chicago people here. So he's a Cubs fan, and I'm correct. <laughs> well, you gotta go. You gotta go to both. By the way, I went to Old Comiskey just before they tore it down, so I can ah. say I was there before. Yeah, I so, live a stone's throw away. Yeah. Well, all right. So it's great to see you both, and it's not that long. By the way, it's not that long till pitchers and catchers. Oh, they're on strike. Oh, I forgot about that. It is a long time for pitchers and catchers. So go to news9.com, see Brittany's story on this. And when it becomes a, when it becomes on display, I'm sure that we will follow up on that. Oh, and yeah. thank you. Thank you both for working on this jail story that so many people are interested in that. And there's so many permutations when the legislature comes back in session, they're going to be dealing with a lot of this. And somebody, I think it was you storm that mentioned about how it became nonpartisan. I remember distinctly when after state question 780 passed, how John Eccles and Jason Dunnington, uh, filed that legislation and then got it to the governor, got it signed to make state question 780 retroactive. It's particularly significant because of thinking of a conservative Republican leader of the House GOP who was doing that. Mm -hmm. Gives you some idea how public opinion has shifted. Yeah. Not nearly as mean as it used to be. Well, you also, you're talking about public opinion and politics in Oklahoma County, there's a uh, district attorney's race coming up that we'll see across the spectrum where people land on criminal justice reform issues. And I think it may be more bipartisan or nonpartisan than you expect. I think you might be surprised by some people's positions. Okay, that sounded like a tease. We're looking forward to that. Brittany Tulis, Storm Jones, thank you both. Thanks to all of you who tuned in tonight. 
I think Augusta will be back next week. She may stand us up again. I don't know. But I uh, really appreciate Brittany and Storm uh, coming on tonight. And we will see you next week. And uh, tomorrow, no testing in OCC HD. Busters are going to run late. Thanks, David Payne. Woo. Good night, everyone. Zip it up. <laughs>